All right, is everybody ready? Everyone got their snacks and their coffee and we're ready to go? Okay, good. Well, I'm excited about this next panel. We had a pre-call and was very happy to meet these gentlemen. And I think you know we're going to have a fairly rowdy experience up here <laughs> with this panel. So if you're ready, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Jorge Benitez. He is the chief executive for Accenture for North America. Jorge, if you will join me up here. And now that you know that I'm going to ask you a question, your question is, what is your favorite movie? My favorite movie And if is, you don't have a favorite, you can give me no, top. I, I, okay. I've got one. Okay. Guess who's coming to dinner? Ah. That's my favorite movie. Okay. Well, there you go. All right. Our next speaker, Mark Bertolini, chairman and CEO and president of Aetna. Mark, please join us. All right, and your question is, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? That's easy, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, I like that. All right, next, Secretary Steve Preston, the former HUD Secretary and Administrator for the Small Business Administration. Please join us. And your question this afternoon is, what private sector leader has been an inspiration to you and why? Uh, uh, Bill Pollard, who was the CEO of Service Master uh, when I was there, and he was just a terrific, uh, uh, is a terrific man who leads out of principles and uh, just a strong kind of construct around leadership. All right, great. And our last speaker is the Honorable David Walker, former Comptroller General and head of the U.S. Government Accountability Office and founder and CEO of Comeback America Initiative. And your question is, what is your favorite book of all time? Oh, Lord, my favorite book of all time. How about the Bible? <laughs> there you go. All right. Well done. It's so an well honest done. answer. There you go. People aren't used to honest answers in this town. <laughs> <laughs> At least in this town. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> all right. So you have their bios and your information, so you know a little bit more about them. I just like to always find out a little personal perspective on each individual. And with that, what I'd like to do is, again, have you do a three to five minute <coughs> overview. And I want to start with you, Jorge. I think this was an idea that you cooked up with Governor Engler, I believe, what we're doing here. So here we are. There are a lot more cooks in that kitchen than just, uh, just You're the reason here. we're here. <laughs> a little bit. Let's start with you. Uh, so just a, a few perspectives, right, if I could sort of kick things off a little bit. Um, I mean, this panel is all about trying to understand the federal government in the context of challenges and opportunities here. So I, I thought I'd just try to dimensionalize it. This is how I think about things, right? So when you take into account the federal government, it's a, it's a $4 trillion annual spend, uh, 2 million employees with other, another 2 million contracts. So it's 4 million people. Uh, they have roughly 10,000 buildings of office space and about 400 million in terms of uh, square footage, right? Uh, and uh, a lot going on. I mean, there's six, there's, uh, you know, 15 departments, 60 different agencies. It's a big, complex organization. And when I think about big, complex organizations, particularly the federal government, who has, and they have evolved over decades, right? I mean, let's face it, this is not something somebody blew up, I mean, defined in a blueprint and started yesterday. This has evolved over, you know, a long, long time. Uh, when I think about something that big and that complex, uh, I really think about the impact that even a small change can make in terms of having some dramatic uh, real change uh, in, in terms of savings potential, right? So when I think about you know, transformation and I think about what are the kinds of things that you would do, I probably group them into two categories. There are mission-related things, which is are we doing the right things? Should we deal with defense and the role we have in the society today? Should we deal with welfare the same way? Things like that. Uh, and frankly, those are in the too hard pile, I think, to start with. So I kind of focus on what are the things that you can do that lots of industries have done, and I think state and federal governments have done, to deal with how do you bring about sustainable change, which really gets into the efficiency part of the thing. Uh, and when I think about that, I think about IT rationalization. I think about figuring out uh, shared services, a number of other proven practices that basically lots of organizations have done, even big complex ones, to do that. 
We've done some work at Accenture to approximate that one percentage productivity improvement in the federal government will yield a trillion dollars worth of benefits in roughly 13 years. It's a wow. big number, right? But 1% is not something that's, frankly, hard to do. I mean, industries do 2, 5, 10% all the time. So it's in the can-do category. Um, now, there were a number of speakers who talked about the challenges of the federal government, so I'm not going to cover that. Uh, but I do think that the opportunities are there. Uh, and I think there are a number of state and, and city and other examples out there that uh, can bring about sustainable change in a very positive light. And so I'm optimistic that in the right leadership and with the right focus on doing the right things, we can frankly do a lot to make government much, much better and really transform it in ways that uh, I think are necessary. All right, thank you. Mark. So transformation is not a, an event. Transformation is a way of life. Um, my career, very early on, I learned that um, I fix broken things and build new things. I don't make the trains run on time. Hence, my lifelong pursuit of driving a Zamboni machine, which they won't let me do. <laughs> <coughs> because I would break it. I'm sure there's more than one pattern that works on the ice. And, and so, it's true. There's got to be. Um, somebody tried them all, right? Um, but I think the, so if you think of transformation as a way of life, then you should never stop. So therefore, you never start. And I can um, tell you that throughout my career, every three to four years, I've gone through a very planful process, just went through it with our company again and recently announced some changes, that starts with the customer. You know, it's really about the operating model. And the operating model is built on sort of three distinct sections. First, what does the customer need? And what does that mean in the way of product design? Secondly, how do you build that product? And then third, how do you deliver to the customer? So if you think about businesses throughout time, Ford Motor Company back in the beginning, we're going to build a black Model T, we're going to build it in mass production and make it cheap, and we're going to deliver it to our customers through local stores, which is how they sold it initially. That was their operating model back then. So once you've understood your operating model, and why do you need to understand your operating model on an ongoing basis? Because your customers change all the time, and their needs change all the time. So once you understand that operating model, the next is, what are the kinds of talents I need in order to effectively enact that operating model? And those are the people. And back to Ford Motor Company, $5 a day for construction, for, for assembly line workers, brought the best people to put together Model Ts and create mass production back in the early days. And by the way, put money in their pocket to be able to afford a car. So it was all about the kind of people that you bring to the situation. So what are the talents I need? Engineering, manufacturing, sales, service, all those sorts of things. What kind of people do I need and do I have that talent? And then the third is what is the management process or the governance model by which I will make sure that those people are meeting the needs of the customers through the operating model we've decided to face off to the marketplace. That's it. You notice what I didn't talk about? Organization structure. Because mm -hmm. organi organization structure really is just an overlay to make sure the management process has rails to run on. It is not the way to fix, your, to fix the organization. Organization structure is last, and it's really built around the kind of people you have in the organization that can effectively operate the management process to oversee the people to make sure you're delivering your product to the marketplace. So why isn't that happening in government today? Because we assume that the operating model is fixed because we start with the organization structure. Mm. There were people doing these jobs in the prior administration, which by the way happens every three or four years. There were people in these jobs before. We need to replace them. And they will figure out what we need to do to meet the needs of what we thought the operating model was 200 plus years ago. <laughs> and so I think we start at the wrong end of the continuum when we think about how we run our business if we think about running the business of government. And every three to four years is a perfect time to renew. And I've done it in every organization. I've changed the organization, changed the people around, and given everybody a fresh perspective on how to meet the needs of our customers. That way you don't need to do a turnaround 
you continue to transform. The only constant is transformation. So I think we need to relook at the model and the way we operate the business versus looking at the lens of who's doing it and how we're doing it. Steve Jobs had a very effective way of talking about his business. It was about the why first. What are we doing to meet the needs of the customer? Then it was the how. How are we going to deliver that? And then it was the what. What do we need to do that? Too often in our world, we talk about the what first, then we figure out how we're going to do it, and then we talk about why we're going to do it afterwards to try and explain it to everybody else. So I think this paradigm has to be flipped, and I think it's our opportunity to make things better in a lot of places, one of which could be the government, the way the government operates. All right, thank you. Good. I'm the only one with notes, so that's a bad sign for me. I, think. <laughs> I need the crutch here. It's okay. Um, even though I was introduced by my government roles uh, historically, I've, just by way of background, I've spent about 90% uh, 90, 90 plus of my career in the private sector, so I probably see the world a lot more like most of us in this room. Um, having been a CEO, uh, CFO for a couple of large companies earlier in my career, banker. Um, so uh, a couple of months ago, I was reading an article about uh, the Romney transition team. And uh, I was talking a little bit about the leadership on the team, and they referred to uh, one of the leaders who uh, it was a former business leader and one who was a former bureaucrat. I was the former bureaucrat. So I don't know <laughs> if I'll ever shake the title. But uh, anyway, I did spend nearly three years here uh, in Washington in the belly of the beast uh, running, running two federal agencies, uh, both of which were dealing with national crises uh, when I was running them. Uh, at first, the Small Business Administration, um, which, in addition to its small business mission, uh, has the job of making loans to homeowners who've lost their homes in a disaster. Uh, and it was almost a year after Katrina, and very few people had gotten their loans. Really, the machinery around that process had collapsed. And the SBA had very similar problems in its uh, other small business programs, its lending programs, were terrible operational issues, and it was dead last uh, in the federal best places to work survey. So we had a huge, huge morale issues. I then went to HUD uh, just as um, the housing crisis was reaching full bloom. During a period of time when major legislation was in place to reform the housing market, we were going to have to implement that on short order. Fannie and Freddie were about to be taken into conservatorship. Uh, FHA, which is part of HUD, was going from about 3% of the housing market or the mortgage market to about 30 we were there for about 15% of that rise, and we were operating on 30-year-old COBOL systems and paper-based processes. So I've, I've, I've definitely seen two large bureaucracies under stress uh, in action. And the federal government is really a Six Sigma black belts, dream or nightmare, I'm not sure which. <laughs> uh, there is just enormous opportunity here. Uh, the fight we all see in the public uh, is often about policy, right? Those are the big, meaty issues that we can all grab onto and debate and get frustrated about. Those issues are enormously important. But so many of the issues we face are driven by failed execution, right? Uh, regulators who don't understand our businesses or are unresponsive, uh, programs that don't drive the intended outcomes because they're not designed well or they're not managed well. Sometimes you've got terrific programs that aren't managed well, actually and resources that are wasted because of uh, significant inefficiencies. Um, so I told the group here I'd give a very quick snapshot on what we did at SBA uh, as part of our transformation agenda. Uh, we, took, we undertook a very ambitious agenda to change the agency, targeted primarily at things that we thought we could execute. And really, we did it exactly the same way all of us do it in the private sector. We just had to thread the needle a little bit differently in the federal context. First, we dug very deep to understand the core issues at the agency. Um, and we spent time with our customers, which were banks and small businesses and uh, uh, citizens who were receiving aid. We spent a tremendous amount of time with our employees, listening to them. Uh, I don't know about you all, my view is that 90% of the uh, problems can be diagnosed by talking to your employee base. They see everything. It's the best source of information we have. We spend a lot of time with data. Often you can't get data in the federal government. Sometimes it's challenging. Where we didn't have it, we tried to construct a good proxy. Uh, secondly, armed with all that feedback, we engaged agency leadership. Now, I think most of you know leadership in federal agencies, you've got political leaders and you've got uh, sort of the career staff, which is 95% plus of the agency generally. And there's often a divide there. My view is I didn't care what they were. I cared if they cared, and I cared if they were competent. And, and we broke a lot of rules in terms of who led what. We had a lot of career people leading uh, political people. It didn't matter. We wanted to drive the solution. We wanted to engage people who cared. Um, 
Next, we establish principles for our transformation. We call them our four pillars. Very simple, nothing, nothing overwhelming here. Our first pillar was all of our initiatives needed to be outcomes driven. They need to be measurable. We need to understand where we were heading and be able to track our progress there. The next three pillars had to do with the types of things we were trying to address. The most important one was being customer focused. Both agencies I ran were large service organizations, and we needed to focus on improving service quality and the outcomes that our programs were designed to drive. The, second, the third one we called employee enabled, which was giving people technology, tools, and training to become better enablers of that service quality for our customer. And the last thing was about being a good steward with what we were doing. It was about accountability and efficiency and transparency and running a, a good government. Those were the four pillars of our transformation, and everything we did really connected with those. And then finally, we put in place a very rigorous program management process with a team that uh, worked with all the leadership to make sure we were driving, driving the initiatives. Uh, metrics, milestones, regular assessment processes, the same thing we all do in business, red, yellow, green stoplight reports. The difference is we put everything up on the website. We invited Congress in to look at our progress. We told them when we were failing and why we were failing and how we were going to fix it. And we, we, we very much drove forward a, a, a program of visibility into how we were changing and why and where it was taking it, us. Our reforms were very low on rocket science and what I would say is very high on insight and just solid management principles. Uh, in many cases, Congress actually wanted to give us more money because they saw the problems. Let me just say the White House didn't want to give us more money, but Congress wanted to give us more money. Um, but what we didn't need was money. We needed management, and that's really what we focused on, and that was the primary uh, uh, driver of what we did. Um, one of my favorite things uh, about what we were able to achieve in most cases is that the federal employees who are historically part of the problem, they felt like they were the ones who were losing, they felt like they were the ones who weren't delivering, became part of the solution because those were the same people that we engaged to drive the transformation forward. They felt like winners and it really did a tremendous amount uh, for all of us uh, to really kind of change, change the mood of the place. And, and uh, when the next government survey came out, we, we were the most improved federal agency in the best places to work survey. It's helpful to start with a low bar, but I'll take it, you know. So, but in any case, it was a big part of what we did. And uh, Max Steyer from the Partnership for Public Services is back there who does that, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. So in closing, let me just say something, uh, one, one more thing. This is something, execution is something we should all really care about, okay? It affects the responsiveness of our government, um, whether it is patents, whether it is dealing with trade issues, whether it's dealing with visas. It affects the impact of regulations, and we don't have to look any harder than over the last couple of years looking at Dodd-Frank or the healthcare legislation or consumer finance. Um, all of this stuff is promulgated through hundreds of regulations and having the right people who understand the impact of those, driving those, has an enormous impact on all of us. Uh, it affects the efficiency of government during a time when resources are dear and it affects our government's ability to understand our issues and help us become more competitive and, and uh, you know, enable reforms that are good for American business. Um, not a one of us uh, in this room, uh, in, business ro you know, in, our, in our business leadership roles, have driven innovation or quality or efficiency without excellent execution. And uh, we can't affect the federal government to do, to do it either. Good, thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I spent 21 years in the private sector, run organizations with global responsibilities for a line of business for a, a firm. I've spent 15 years in, in the government, ran three federal agencies, two in the executive branch, one in the legislative branch, and I've run two nonprofits. So I've been in all three sectors of the economy. Uh, with regard to my government experience, I can tell you, in my view, government's grown too big, promised too much, waited too long to restructure, but it's not too late. Uh, there needs to be a fundamental transformation. Uh, in order to make a transformation happen, you have to have a burning platform. A uh, burning platform means you either have to face a crisis that's imminent and therefore it forces you to change, or you have to create a condition where people understand that you are on an imprudent and unsustainable path, mm -hmm. and if you don't change course, there will be a crisis and the adverse consequences of failing to act are much greater than taking prudent steps 
to be able to try to avoid it and create a better future. Uh, I gave all of my fellow panelists uh, this one-page summary, front and back, in, in the interest of full and fair disclosure, <laughs> folded in a trifold, which takes the 170 to 180 page annual report of the U.S. government uh, and puts it on one page in clear, concise, and compelling terms. This is the burning platform, okay? Uh, and if you don't get a burning platform out of this, uh, you know, you need to do something else. <laughs> uh, but but the, the, the bottom line is we know, as Governor Pawlenty said, that what the drivers are of our financial problems. They're, you know, they're demographics, uh, their health care, mm -hmm. their social insurance programs. I don't use the word entitlements because they're not entitlements. The Supreme Court has already ruled they're not entitlements. Uh, uh, and, and an outdated tax system. But what Simpson Bowles, the Minute Revlin, and all these groups have not focused on is the areas of, of, of uh, what government does, how government does business, uh, who does the government's business, economy, efficiency, effectiveness, uh, credibility, sustainability. The, the basic blocking and tackling, it doesn't make any difference whether you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Believe it or not, we've been in business as a republic since 1789. We don't have three things that Management 101 says you have to have to maximize success, mitigate risk, uh, and ensure sustainability. There's no plan. There's no budget. And there's no outcome-based performance metrics. And we wonder why we have a problem. <laughs> uh, when I headed up GAO, uh, we had a budget. We didn't have a plan. And we didn't have performance metrics. So we led by example. We implemented that. It was principles and values based. Uh, we used uh, uh, and we totally restructured the organization after we determined what we wanted to do, how we measured success. We aligned incentives, transparency, and accountability mechanisms at the institutional, the unit, and the individual level. Uh, and uh, we restructured and modernized our technology, uh, did a number of things. After nine years, we were 13% smaller, 50 to 100% more productive, and two to three times the outcome-based results. And we were rated number two in the federal government employee satisfaction, even though we made dramatic and fundamental changes. What we did was not rocket science, okay? Uh, it is transferable, it is scalable. The question is, why hasn't it been? Uh, you need truth, transparency, and leadership to get transformation. And in the case of the government, you don't have leaders that are there long enough. Uh, and as we know, when you're making transformational change, it goes from patience, persistence, to perseverance, to pain <laughs> before you prevail. And you've got to be willing to go through all of those things, and you've got to be willing to have people that are willing to go through all that. In my view, there's a lot of good ideas about what need to be done, needs to be done. The question is, how do you get it done? Mm -hmm. Because implementation is 90% of success or failure in any organization. Uh, and implementation is what the problem is typically in government, all right? Mm -hmm. It's not, we've got good people, very dedicated people, highly educated people, very committed to mission. So my view is you've got to recognize that you have, uh, you have uh, vested interest and conflicts of interest. You have the Congress, which is totally dysfunctional. It can't manage itself, much less anything else. You have the executive branch that is part of a administration that is affiliated with a political party, uh, and there's not a whole lot of trust in town. And so my view is, is that we need a new mechanism. We need a mechanism that can be able to take a large known and growing challenges and opportunities dealing with economy efficiency effectiveness uh, and be able to tee up recommendations that will be given automatic consideration by the President and the Congress with a guaranteed vote uh, in, in appropriate circumstances. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things I'm working on now. It's called the Government Transformation Initiative Coalition. It is a concrete proposal to try to actually implement a number of the things that people have been talking about, whether it is, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, reorganization authority that will save money, because a lot of reorganizations don't save money in government, okay? Whether it's real estate, you know, whether it's human capital, whether it's duplicative programs, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, information systems, whether it's procurement approaches. Uh, this is not rocket science, but we've got to be able to have a process that will lead to an outcome. Uh, and uh, I think that's going to take uh, legislation. All right, good. The Twitter feeds are probably going wild right now because those are great <laughs> sound bites for, yeah. for a tweet. 
I am actually I'm going to stay with you. So this panel is about the challenges and opportunities. I really don't want to talk about the challenges. We've been talking about the challenges all day. Yeah. It seems like we all know the challenges. I do, though, want you to elaborate on your comment because you've made this several times. You compare the United States to Rome. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? Or Greece. Or yes. On. Whoever well, you want to pick on. Rome, I mean, you know, Rome's the long, longest standing republic in the history of mankind, and it no longer exists uh, as a republic, okay? Uh, you know, it, um, it had a decline in moral and ethical values. Uh, it... Um, uh, it, it ex expanded, uh, you know, uh, with regard to its reach, uh, its military reach to the point where it was stressed. It couldn't protect its borders, uh, and it was fiscally irresponsible. Do some of those sound familiar? Uh, you know, it, it, we need to learn from history. We need to learn from others. Uh, you, you know, we need to adopt best practices. We need to avoid, you know, common mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, uh, and, and so, again, I'm not saying we're Rome. I'm just saying we need to learn the lessons from Rome. We need to learn the lessons from Greece. You know, Greece now is a basket case, mm -hmm. all right? But it was, it was the cradle of democracy, the greatest civilization on earth. It once controlled most of the known world. And it strayed from the principles and values that made it great. And now it's, it, it's suffering the consequences. We, frankly, strayed from the principles and values that made us great. The difference is, you know, we can turn it around. And the objective is, how do we do that? That is true, and that's what we're here to discuss yeah. this afternoon. So, I want to start with you, Jorge. It was great because the gentleman from OMB really set you up beautifully because he had words like strategic sourcing, innovation, shared services, procurement reform, reorganization. So, I know that you really specialize, Accenture specializes a lot in the transformation of business and government, and I know you've probably seen that around the world. Share with us some of your favorite examples of government transformation. So, I mean, we, we've done work in, in lots of different forms, but, but I would highlight some of the stuff we're doing at the state level, right? And, and again, a common practice of shared services is something that industry's been doing for a long time. It's not rocket science, if I can use it again. It's something very common. And at Ohio, we're doing that uh, in, a, in a significant way today, and I think that has great applicability. I think that, uh, that we're doing some other work in Massachusetts, again, shared services. Uh, and, and I think we're also doing some uh, procurement uh, work and sourcing work uh, in a bunch of other cities. And, and the reality is these are things that have been proven, tried and true multiple times and are not uh, risky ventures, right? They may not have been done at mass scale in the government sectors in the past, but I think they're proven and they're yielding results today. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we could do more of those kinds of things, which is why I was trying to describe that I think we're better off to do some of the tried and proven things at the federal government that will be easier to do than a, a very significant transformation when it comes to the mission elements that I think are going to be much more difficult to get alignment with the multiple stakeholders that are involved. So then you're finding a lot of low-hanging fruit here that Absolutely. we can completely start with. Absolutely. All right. So, Steve, let's talk a little bit. You, you talked a lot about what you did at SBA and HUD, but, you know, you were quoted as being credited with the most sweeping changes since the Great Depression at HUD, and obviously you led huge transformation at SBA. How did you accomplish this, though? I mean, I think the question is, you know, we know that we can do some of these things because we see it all over the country in small places, in small pockets. How did you do that, though? I think you have to, um, you have to engage your workforce to be part of the solution. And um, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult here because I think often, it, for, first of all, the federal government ex is extremely hierarchical. I mean, I, it, it, you know, one of the hardest things for me was to walk into a room and have people refer to me to the third person when I was standing next to them. And it was, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what, if they didn't see me or, you know, what it was, you know. And, uh, and so for us, a big part of what we did was reach out to our teams and say, you know, we think that this is broken. What do you think is broken? Bring us, give us your best, give us your insights, help us become part of this solution. Because when you engage that team, they begin to own it. And the other thing I'll tell you is, mm -hmm. 
a lot of these federal workers had been here for years and had ideas that they just never got sponsorship for, okay. had a vision for what could possibly be. Know that the line is up there, but the, the, you know, the, the, the trip to that line is insurmountable but without the right kind of sponsorship. And so a lot of what we did was really try to understand where those opportunities, some of them were burning platforms, some of them we had to do. Disaster loan program was completely broken, right? right? Um, but where, where are those opportunities? Who believes in them? Are they valid? And then let's put together the team and get there. The, one of the challenges we had, with, I think, with the federal uh, workforce was a lot of the people on the team knew a tremendous amount about sort of the policies and sort of how to negotiate through the federal government. A lot of, the, a lot of our leadership didn't have skills on how to execute um, a, a, a complex uh, reform. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have. So what we did is we actually paired them with people who did and taught them along the way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can drive change unless, you know, you sort of win the hearts and minds of the people uh, in the organization because they, they need to be part of, they need, they need to lead it with you. And then the other thing is when you walk out the door, they need to sustain it. Right. And that is a big challenge. And if they don't believe in it, um, it's going to go away. So that, I, I think that was the most essential element we had. So to a follow-up question, do you know currently is that still in existence in the Well, there are any number of, there are many initiatives, but uh, for the most part, the bigger initiatives we had that really drove the big change, absolutely. Absolutely. And some of them you kind of burn the bridge, right? You know, you put in place an entirely new process that's supported by new technology with a new structure and you sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, let the cement dry, and that's 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 the way it works in the future. So we we worked very hard. In fact, when I was leaving before I left SBA, I put in place a uh, uh, a group of career leaders. N none of the political people were allowed to be in the group of career leaders. We called it our sustainability group before sustainability meant something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And their their uh, their mandate was to figure out how to make sure that the reforms lived, and where they were at risk. Um, uh, and if, and if, you know, uh, if they needed to be improved or changed, you know, where that needed to be, but they needed to own it going forward. Right. Good. You wanted to add something at, here? Yeah. At GAO, I was the only political appointee. Out of 3,200 people, I was the only political appointee. Mm -hmm. And so by definition, it had to get done with dedicated career professionals. You had to get them to buy in. Right. And part of the strategy was you focus on clients or customers, you focus on the people, you focus on your partners, your alliance partners, your network of partners, and you focus on results. Uh, and you have to institutionalize these things such that they will stay beyond your tenure. Because by definition, in government, most of the leaders are, uh, you know, that are, polit are political appointees. I mean, the very top people are political appointees. And by definition, they're temporary help. Okay, They're only going to be there two to four years or whatever else, maybe a little bit longer in some circumstances. So you have to get buy-in, yeah. and you have to institutionalize it in order for it to be sustained over time. Uh, and fortunately, in our case, it, it, has, you know, it has been. Let me just piggyback on, on one thing David said. One of the big mantras we had um, was, was, you know, everybody needed to understand how their job touched our customers. My view is everybody in an organization, somehow there's a chain of events that touches a customer. So when, when the disaster loan program, for example, was collapsed, there was a lot of infighting, a lot of pointing fingers at each other. And um, you know, I, I launched a, a, you know, a three-day offsite with all the leadership to figure out how we were going to fix this thing. And what I did is I sent my, camp, my, my, my communications director down to New Orleans and I said, I want you to tape people telling their stories about what they dealt with. I want, I, want you to, I want every person in that room to hear the pain, the success, what it meant to them to get their disaster loan. It was, you know, it was chilling to listen to some of these stories. And we walked into that room, people were pointing fingers at each other. It was a completely dysfunctional group. The lights came on and I said, the battle is out there. Okay, that's, that's who we're here to serve. Those are the people. Everybody gets a free pass for failure in the past. Going forward, we're locking arms and that's the mission. And, and so a lot of what we tried to do time and again was change the language so that people actually felt, uh, I think a lot of them tapped into their dream of service again mm -hmm. and really felt like they were doing something uh, that mattered. And um, you know, people in a loan processing center, we talked about how uh, driving the change that they were working on was going to help entrepreneurs get capital. So it, it was, it was you know, to David's point, yeah. it was a big part of what we did as well. Nice. 
Well, you know, it's great having Mark here. While we were over there by the food, he was steering us away from the chips and over to the apples. So that was really good. Put the cookie down. That's right. He put the cookie down. That's what he was saying. So you are passionate and have been very active in the National Dialogue on Healthcare Reform. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you have a bunch of ideas. What ideas do you have that can really further transform can further transform this area? What do you think can have some real impact here? So um, I think let's start with um, why it's important. The healthcare system drives the global economy. If you look around the world, and we're in the Middle East and China and, and Europe, mm -hmm. um, healthcare and the social contracts that have been signed with most of the world's population are not being met and won't be able to be met unless we restructure the system. Um, in the Middle East, you know, an incredible crushing disease burden around diabetes. Um, in China, people are saving 30% of their income so that 10% goes to education first, the next 10% goes to health care, and the third 10% goes to housing. Mm. And because they have so many people living in cities now, 53% of their population, they need to create domestic consumption because they're now importing as much as they're exporting to support people in their cities. And the only way you get domestic consumption is to free up personal disposable income, and the only way to free up personal disposable income is to create safety nets, education, health care, which we take for granted in this country. And, and so health care is an imperative for them. And by the way, low, low carbon footprint, high volume employment sector to create more personal disposable income. So health care is a central economic mechanism in virtually every economy around the world. Here in the United States, by virtue of the IOM, 2009, a bunch of doctors, so not insurance company executives, said that they were wasting one-third of what we spend on health care every year in unnecessary services, fraud, waste, and abuse. So last year was $2.7 trillion, so that's 900, or 30%, they're saying. So 30%, so that's, that's $810 billion a year that we waste. So what if we fix that problem? Over 10 years, that solves half of the nation's debt, $8 trillion. If we solved half of it, we could do what Simpson Bowles purported to do, $4 trillion. If we solve 20% of it, we pay for the Affordable Care Act and get everybody insured. So that's the problem. It's how do we get at that waste and abuse. And that requires us to restructure the system not restructure the way we pay for it. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Detroit. I'm a Michigander like John is. And, and you know, in the 50s and 60s, you used to be able to buy a car. You walk into a dealership and say, I can afford $325 a month. And if you bought a car that way, you got stolen. You, 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 they took your money because they would produce some sort of vehicle and say, you can finance this whole thing out the door. It's yours for $325 a month. Smart people today buy the car I want these attributes, these kinds of colors, this kind of wheels, all that sort of thing. How much does it cost? And then they finance it. So we need to separate the finance from the investment decision. And the invest, because they're confused now in the healthcare system, what we have is this, uh, this waste of $810 billion a year. So the way to get at that is to restructure the system and to put insurance companies out of the business they're in, like Aetna, and put us in the business of making the healthcare system work better by helping providers understand how they can manage risk. And that's what we're doing. We're reinventing our business model where we will become the intel and side behind health systems, helping systems manage the care better versus having us tell them how to manage the care. We know how to do it better because we see the whole system, they don't. And so it takes technology, it takes intellectual property, it takes the willingness to give it up, so we have to cross the boundary to our partners and say, we can do this together. <clears throat> it puts them out front, and our goal is that by the time the exchanges get up and running, which will be more than just in 2014, I hope you're all aware of that, um, <laughs> that when they get up and running, that the exchanges that will be out there will have Innova Health System as the product powered by Aetna, not Aetna that the brand and the local market will be the physicians and the hospitals in that community as an economic partner to improve the productivity and the vibrancy of the economy within which they work. 
And then long after, when I've either got my feet in the sand or my body's six feet under the dirt, we will move to a system where we don't need benefits, we don't need a policing mechanism, and what we have is what we started in San Diego back in the 70s called a social HMO, where we provide whatever services are necessary in order to make sure the person stays healthy and out of the hospital and out of the doctor's office. So if a mother of three needs diapers because she can't afford them, we give them to her. If an elderly person needs a cab ride for a follow-up visit after being discharged with congestive heart failure, number one driver of readmission congestive heart failure, no follow-up visit within two weeks mm. to monitor their medication. And so we can get them to the, so if we need to pay for the cab ride, $100,000 in admission or a $25 <laughs> cab ride. I mean, you do the math, right? That's the system we need to move to. It's population management. And the health system then becomes an economic essential to the community versus a cost, dri cost driver. Hmm. Can I give yes. an example? Yes. Yes. Go I, ahead. I mean, Mark spoke very passionately about how the future will unfold here, right? And I just want to give an example of something that we're doing with a, uh, a hospital provider network, right? That dramatizes an example of how this would work, right? So when you go to the hospital today and you have a particular pain in your abdomen, then you get a battery of tests. You may get 15, 20 different tests. And then based on that, they're going to try to figure out something else. What if we could tap using an analytics and, and accessing of data mm -hmm. the last 20,000 people that went to the doctor and had a pain in their stomach? Right. That you could then say, well, maybe I need to give you these two tests based on these three symptoms. Right. And instead of giving you 20 different tests that is going to take several days and a lot of wasted space and a wasted cost, rather, mm -hmm. go through a process and say, I'm going to do these three things based upon what you're telling me is really important to you. Mm -hmm. And this is, by the way, the cure that I'm going to give you much faster than I would have otherwise at a fraction of the cost. That is being done today. Right, as an example. Right. So we just need to be able to do this bigger scale. That's great. It's really yes. pretty fundamental. There's a bigger picture here. Um, for any system to be successful and sustainable, you have to meet three tests. You have to have properly designed and integrated incentives that encourage people to do the right thing and discourage them from doing the wrong thing. You have to have adequate transparency as to cost and quality and other factors to provide reasonable assurance they will and you have to have appropriate accountability if they don't. Now, guess what? Healthcare, K through 12 education, and a few other things were a strikeout, zero for three. Yep. We have to get back to the fundamentals. We have a dramatic transformation. And I used to be a, a, a trustee of Medicare, Social Assistance Secretary of Labor for Pensions and Health, and now I've agreed to co-chair the Institute of Medicine's end of life panel, which is, a, you know, which is an issue that's very complex, very controversial. It's been demagogued too much, but you've got to deal with it, all right? And uh, I don't mind being called Dr. Dave. Just don't call me Dr. Death. Yes. All right. Well, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll add to So very important program, this end-of-life issue. It's more than 50% of most people's lifetime health care costs mm -hmm. yeah. is the last year of their life. I'm sure. So on July 15, 2002, I put my son into hospice. He was 17 years old. Now, he happens to be working now at Sturdy Street Financial Advisors. He's a quant. He survived hospice because we found a medication for him. Wow. But I had to admit he was going to die in six months and that he could no longer seek curative services. So when I got back to work at Aetna, because I moved into his hospital room for, with him for a year and a half and lived with him in his hospital room and took care of him, when I got back to work at Aetna, I said, we need to change our hospice program. So what we did is we eliminated the requirement that, that people had to agree they were going to die in six months, and we eliminated the requirement that they could no longer seek curative services, that they could seek any kind of services they wanted while they were in hospice. We saw hospice use go from 24% of the population that died to 80% of the population. We saw hospital days drop by 89%, and we saw end-of-life costs drop by 79%. Wow. And so what we've done now is we've implemented it for all of our clients for free. You, here's your program. We're not going to hold you to the Medicare guidelines for hospice, which is you've got to admit you're going to die and you can't seek curative services. Because Medicare made those rules back in the 70s when they thought it was going to break the bank if they allowed people to be in hospice. And it's actually cheaper. And the letters I get from families about that program are incredible. Now, we brought this to IOM two years ago in the middle of the whole health care reform debate, and that's what started the whole death panel conversation. And so we backed off. But those programs are available today, and I, you know, I'm, we have the study. It's a published study. I'd be more than happy to I'd support like to you in any way. All right, good. Let's switch gears for a second here. So, Steve, let me just ask you a question. <laughs> Why? H how did you come to the, quote, Valley of the Beast? How did Valley of the Beast? Yes. 
the belly of the beast. Um, you know, uh, it, it, in a very unlikely way, it was, you know, a, a former colleague of mine was working in the administration, and she called and said, you know, uh, we are really looking for people who know how to run things, because a lot of people in the jobs here are great policy and legal people, but they don't have management experience. Mm -hmm. And so, would you ever be interested in throwing your hat in the ring? And, um, you know, I was sort of at a point in life where I was looking at making a different kind of impact. Uh, right. And uh, when I got the call about the SBA, I said, you know what, I've watched those people on the news. I've, I've seen what's going on down there. Uh, I called a good friend of mine who's a senior uh, executive recruiter, and he said, don't do it. You're at a perfect point in your career. <laughs> it's, you're going to ruin yourself. <laughs> You'll be unemployable after this. <laughs> And I just said, I, I just, I got, I got to do this. I, I just got to do this. So, We're I've got. Still friends. Uh, he, we are still friends. <laughs> we are still really? friends. And thankfully, thankfully, I got a job when I came out. Uh, but we took the. I've got five kids. We took the five kids and moved them out here and just said, this is a season in life for us. And you know, uh, I got to tell you, you know, people always say, oh man, the the financial impact is so big. Obviously, you take a massive cut in salary to come out here. But you know, I think when you look back on life and you know what you've done and the impact you've made and mm -hmm. how you've affected people, I don't think there's anything better if you can have a position of impact here. I mean, you know, when you when you can move something, when you can move the needle on a problem, it touches so many people. And for me, I dealt with issues either of poverty, people people dealing with poverty issues primarily at HUD, which is a shorter, much shorter tenure for me, or dealing with people who didn't have homes that they were trying to rebuild. So you know, if you kind of want to make an impact and you're a business leader and you have an opportunity, you know, gosh, I, I just don't think there's anything better. Well, Governor Pawlenty in our panel earlier was just talking about the, the problem that we have attracting the right level of people <coughs> to government jobs. So it's, you know. You have to get people who are willing to suspend logic. <laughs> <laughs> Mission oriented. Mission oriented. <laughs> so then, David, you know, you've been big, I've listened to you before, you're big on truth, transparency, and leadership. So what is it going to take to fundamentally shift the federal government? What is it really going to take? You say that it can be done. How oh, is absolutely. that? Absolutely, it absolutely can be done. Here's the frustrating thing to me. I've traveled to all 50 states. I've done, you know, college campuses, town hall meetings, business community leaders, editorial boards, local media. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people are a lot smarter than most elect officials realize. Uh, they know we're in trouble. They can handle the truth. They're willing to accept tough choices as long as they're part of a comprehensive plan they deem to be fair. Right. And I would respectfully suggest the biggest deficit we have in this country is a leadership deficit. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you've got to, when you're talking about making major transformational changes, uh, the CEO has got to lead the way whoever the CEO is. Mm -hmm. Now, the CEO can't get it done by themselves, all right? Like in any transformation, you start at the top, you start at the new, with the new people, you work to the middle. The, the biggest thing to change, the most difficult thing to change are people in the middle who are part of a hierarchy or organization, especially those that are close to retirement. I right. mean, that, that's the way it is anywhere, okay? Right. And so, you, you know, but if you don't have, uh, if you don't have that vision, if you don't have that push from the top, uh, you go on nowhere fast, uh, and and you know there have been some good things that have been done in several administrations, both Republican and Democrat, and that are being done, but we haven't we haven't made that burning platform case. We haven't be, we we haven't seen a mechanism in place that that could take a lot of these good ideas and put them in a position where they can be implemented, uh, and so that's what we're trying to work on on the government transformation initiative. Let me ask you all a question, because this, this word has come up a lot today. Let's talk about transparency. Mm -hmm. We've had a huge movement. It actually started in the states. There was legislation mm -hmm. in many states that mm -hmm. drove transparency in state and local government, and it became a big movement here. What do you think the impact is going to be? I mean, I've seen it in California. For example, our controller's office has a huge transparency site where you can find, because of the problems in Bell, California, that you might have all heard about mm -hmm. our management there. So there's transparency sites everywhere. How is this going to change the game? At first, it's got to be clear, concise, useful, used, and compelling, all right? You can't just do a file dump. I mean, there's a right. lot of things that people put a lot of stuff out there that's a file dump, okay? What I held up earlier, you know, th this is clear, concise, compelling, 
you know, uh, useful and, and can be used, all right? Uh, so it, it's not just a matter of having it transparent. It's transparent in, in the right form. Right. Let me give you an example. A lot of the problems that are experienced at the federal, state, and local level are off the balance sheet, all right? There are huge unfunded obligations that are off the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. and, and in order to restructure those, you're going to have to have a lot more transparency to be able to say, okay, let's benchmark. Let's benchmark these plans, who's eligible, on what basis, at what age, with what subsidy, with what index, <laughs> with, with what you know, cost sharing or, or coverage. Let's, in, let's benchmark that against major employers in the private sector. Because you know, federal workers and state workers and local workers ought to get decent compensation. They ought to have competitive plans. But compared to what? Compared to major employers in a way that are affordable and sustainable. If you do that, all of a sudden the discussion will change. Right. It will change. Because right now, we don't have enough transparency on those issues, and we have large and growing problems that, that, that the system, the political system, doesn't address until there's a crisis that gives it cover to address it. True. And I think, you know, obviously the Sunlight Foundation and many others are driving. There's new transparency sites that pop up all, all over the place. I, I know you want to add something, and then I want to ask Mark about health care, because I'm sure transparency could help here. I think transparency is a tool to build trust. And I think the more that we have, the more facts we have that we can all share, the more that we can come together and ultimately figure out what is really going on. So I, I think it's something that can't be stopped. Right? Right. It's going to be much more prevalent. And uh, what happens now is you have your data, I have my data, others have their data. And if it's different, we're always going to be competing for who it is that has the right data. If we put it all out there and we use it as a transparency tool, we can all agree that, yeah, this is the data. And now let's figure out how we trust each other and get something done. Mm -hmm. Transparency come up in the discussions, healthcare discussions. Oh God, yes. Yeah. Um, and the problem again is the the how the 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 what how why versus the why how what. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, um, I think a lot of the government transparency on now available now is on a what basis. We're going to make sure the procurement process is transparent. We're going to make sure how much we spent on you know. Uh, um, um, you know, T and E is going to be transparent. It really isn't put in with the context of why do I need to know this? Right. And so every turnaround I've done, and I've now done three, I was losing a million dollars a day when I joined it in 2003, was really about, you know, here's the problem. This million dollars a day, 44,000 an hour. That's how many employees we had. So <laughs> it was like every employee reaching hour. in, pulling a dollar out of the till and burning it every hour, 24 <laughs> by 7. The U.S. government's 8.2 million a minute. Yeah, account, uh, the full uh, account. Yeah, post office is contributing 25 million a day. Yeah, um, but the the <laughs> the the whole the whole issue was, you know, here's what's wrong. I accept personal accountability as a leader here to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you how we're going to fix it. And you share with them in a transparent way what's relevant to them to understand. Mm -hmm. They don't care about whether or not you know, we're going to get 2.33% or 3.8% on our 20-year bonds. They don't understand that. But what they should know is how our capital structure affects it and what we're going to do with our assets. So mm -hmm. you can do that. So in healthcare, it's the same issue. I'll use one example. In the city of San Francisco, a routine colonoscopy and it looks like from the age of this group that most people know what that is. Um, <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> An experience. <laughs> a routine colonoscopy. We've got to make it fun. A routine colonoscopy can run anywhere from $1,250 to $7,300 in the same city. Wow. Routine colonoscopy. So I don't know what you get for seven thousand three hundred dollars. Maybe it's a movie, bonbons, and you know, a, a gift card. But you know, it just isn't worth it for a routine colonoscopy. And so, what is the real price, and where should it be, and why don't consumers understand this? Well, first of all, they don't pay enough of it anyway. If I told you you could buy any car you want, and you only have to pay twenty percent, right? And you had ten thousand dollars to spend on a car, what would your car be? It'd be a fifty thousand dollar car, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. I'm picking up the forty, and so that's how we treat our healthcare system. You pay five dollars, and the rest is on me, and you figure it out. So um, Steve Bird from Safeway uses this great example. Let's design a grocery store where you walk in, you get a cart, you walk down the aisle, you pull the product off. All it has is barcodes on it. You go up to the counter, the the clerk swipes. The, the, the products across the thing. There's no screen. At the end of it, they ask you for a credit card. They swipe and they say, in 30 days, you'll get your credit card bill. It'll tell you how much your food, food costs. Would you shop there? <laughs> no. 
But that's exactly how the healthcare system works. And so as we've worked to create transparency with mobile technology and everything else, the real issue is getting people to use it. And we're now at that point where over the last five years, people have had to pick up half of the increase in healthcare costs that their employers have borne over the last five years in the private sector. Yeah. So in another three years, they'll be paying for half their health care. And when you're paying for half your health care, you know how expensive it is, then all of a sudden you start using the technologies to find out what you're spending it on. So I think the time's coming. It just there isn't any reason for people to use it yet. Okay. You know, if you look at, um, just connecting a couple of the dots here, if you look at any, any federal agency, there are dozens and dozens of programs of varying sizes and costs, right? As, a, as an agency leader, there is very, there's virtually no incentive <laughs> to show people your problems, right? Any good leader, I think, and this gets to David's leadership issue and to Mark's transparency issues both, any good leader looks to provide that transparency so everybody can look into those problems, jointly agree on what they are, and drive forward to the solution. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had uh, 20 congressional hearings over 15 months when we were going through the disaster loan issue, so I know, I, I, you know, I know what that feels like to be an agency head with people coming at me, but I gotta tell you, uh, it, it just isn't the mode of operation here. And I'll never forget one of the hearings, a senator saying, well, you've got a problem here, and I, I can see this. And I said, you know, you're right, and let me tell you how big it is. I've got the numbers right here, and let me, I'd love to have you all look at it. Let me tell you how we're addressing it. And it, it really changed the entire dialogue. But the thing is, is if you don't have leaderships, leadership in these organizations who look to bring that transparency out and say, you know what, this program is not performing, or right. this regulation does not hit the mark, or we are incredibly inefficient over here. All of these government organizations, you're not gonna get the reform you need. No, and it's not like you were willing to do that. I, I don't know, some people aren't willing to be maybe that transparent. Well, I think, I think it's part of the, the, the political battle too, right? right. If, if, if you admit you have a problem, you're gonna be up on the hill in a, in a hearing. Right. But um, to me, you know, linking this issue with having leaders who can understand what's happening in these organizations and how to reform them, and people who are willing to say these are the problems that we need to address together, is a huge step forward in getting after the execution challenges here. So, just I'm going to ask a few more questions. Get your questions ready for this great panel. So, just giving you a little warning there. I want to talk about one other kind of overarching area, and that's. Demographics. You talked about this room and the demographics. So one thing I've noticed being out there is younger leaders actually have a bit of a different view of things, particularly from a technology standpoint. In Oklahoma right now, there's very conservative legislators who are leading a huge transformation effort there. They're all very young. We just did a, a big story on these folks. So when I meet with people, I do think that demographics have a lot to do with the change coming. So any comments on demographics or any even any things that you're seeing even within your own businesses? New leaders, younger leaders? I do see a difference when people are grown up digital that they just use it in everyday life and they expect it that it'll be there, right? So I do think that they're more comfortable with technology. It's not as foreign. It's something that they use every day and as a result they're frankly much more willing to try things and, and I think it, it just it's just an easier time for them, right? I mean, you've had the old adage, right? My parents will never actually use an ATM machine and my children will never be in a bank. Well, the reality is technology is changing a lot of that stuff and I think they're more comfortable with it. And I think technology is at the root of a lot of things that we talked about, right. that being able to really sort of drive the needle. I think young leaders um, are willing to attack problems quicker. Mm -hmm. um, I think they lack the experience about how to really execute. Um, young leaders don't and aren't trained in, and I wasn't trained in, um, the skills of getting people to act because you can't do it on your own. So if the problem's small enough and you got a young leader doing it, they'll chase it down, they'll run it down, and we have people that do that all day long in our company. But if you give them a bigger, thornier problem, the issue of relating to people and getting people organized and getting them to change their mind and move ahead is really hard. I mean, my job as CEO is to be unrealistically expectant and patiently tolerant of progress because I have a whole organization of 50,000 people to move. And so the, the idea is, is you know, for younger leaders is to, how quickly can we give them that experience 
or can we support them mm -hmm. to be able to give them the, 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 the people skills they need in order to make major change? Okay. So I think, that's the, I think that's the problem actually here in Washington in a lot right. of ways. You know, I think um, one of the interesting things about Washington, and I mentioned it in my opening comments, is a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, the structures here are very old. A lot of the systems are very old. Both of the agencies I ran were on 30-year-old COBOL systems. I do think by bringing new leaders in who have a different view of how the world works and have a, uh, a different view of where technology is, you can almost leapfrog a lot of steps right. to get to current technologies. And I think when we look at the way the, the, the IT world that we all live in now, um, it is uh, so much more efficient to tap into and to leverage than it was not that long ago. I actually think by bringing in you know, younger, more enlightened leaders around process and technology, just to get a few levels down here, um, can help people envision a different way of service delivery in the federal government that we are not currently set up to even consider. Okay. I agree with everything I've heard so far, but I want to talk about a little bit different dimension, and it, it really isn't dealing with the operations of government. It's dealing with the need to revitalize our democracy mm -hmm. and, to, and to facilitate some of the kind of transformational changes that need to happen. You know, my concern is, is that while young people uh, typically are using you know, technology uh, much more or more comfortable with it, including social networking mm -hmm. and everything. Right. It's also, they're losing the human touch. You know, and I think there's too much to going on where people are trying to do things through uh, uh, using technology, through social networking, et cetera, and there's not as much boots on the ground and people in your face. Uh, like, for example, if I look at what's going on, what, what went on in the Middle East, social networking was used to get people to come together to do things. Here, it's really not. It's people are doing things on social networking, and in order to effectuate some of the kind of changes that we need to have, especially with regard to you know, our political system and, and some of the tough choices that our elected leaders are going to have to make, we're going to have to have more boots on the ground and people in the face at public forums with elected officials and things of that nature. And I don't see that happening. So from an operational standpoint, and all I agree, uh, but, from, but from the standpoint of being able to help revitalize our democracy and put more pressures for people to act to address large known and growing problems uh, and avert a crisis rather than wait until a crisis is at the doorstep and exhibit what I call laggardship rather than leadership, uh, you know, I, I think there's the other side to technology that we have to be aware of. But well, it can be done, Dave. You can. Right. It can. absolutely I agree. It absolutely can. Because we, you know, at, at Aetna, 47% of our employees now work from home full time. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, we, and so they're, they're all telecommuters, and I communicate with them daily because I use social media. Yeah, sure. Right. And, you know, my management layer is less reliable than my social media layer in communicating with the people on the That's front true. lines taking care of customers. That's true. So if you use it right, you can get, you can get, you know, you can, but you have to engage in it and you have to mix it with high touch. Well, plus I'll, I'll just tell you that the city of Boston is, could, they use actually Twitter. I mean, their whole customer service model is all based on social media. And Mayor Menino has been there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. He has some really young, bright folks. He has uh, two, they're called urban mechanics. Mm -hmm. So they're really mm -hmm. looking at reinventing government and customer service there. So they're using this. I, I actually think it's a powerful tool for democracy, personally, just because I've seen great examples of folks using it across the country. But let me open it up to the question to the audience. Any other questions out here? Yes. Here comes the mic. Okay. Uh, Jamie Conrad, Conrad Law and Policy Council. Uh, a fundamental premise of, of today and most of the last two panels has been that government has something to learn from the private sector. And we hear a lot in particular about the importance of executive leadership in terms of setting a tone and driving change and so on. Uh, I mean, the most glaringly obvious difference is that in a corporation, the board has the power to fire the CEO, but otherwise the board is not trying to co-run the company at the same time. And the, you know, the chairman of the board hasn't said, I'm going to get this CEO out of here in the next four years. So, <laughs> so recognizing that, are, are, are any of you at least suggesting that there really ought to be a greater shift of power to the executive, maybe like you have in a parliamentary system, so the executive actually has a chance to 
to run things or, or more that we just sort of somehow have to make it work in the system we have? That, that, that's, a, that's a great question mm -hmm. because I think um, we often confuse the structure <laughs> of the environments we work in as a reason why we can't be effective. And I would argue in private corporations across America that my positional power is far less than chairman and CEOs of prior companies ever were. And that it's my influencing power that gets the organization to move and my willingness to be transparent, honest, and, 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 and to constantly communicate. I have a saying that when I've said it so many times I could puke, I'm only <laughs> halfway there. <laughs> and, and, and so you have to keep at it over and over and over again. And it's really about influencing skills. It's really about you know, evangelism, reaching down to the front line, which is what I use Twitter and, and Facebook for. And also you know, working with the apostry, my team, in ways of making sure they're communicating in an appropriate way throughout the organization, interacting with the clients. We do all, most, a lot of our customer service on Twitter now mm -hmm. as well because I was dealing with customer problems. Mm -hmm. And so that whole transparency, people don't care that I'm the chairman and CEO half the time, quite frankly. It's really my ability to be honest with them and for them to believe in what I'm saying. And that requires me to be consistent in my messaging and consistent in my behavior as I'm dealing with them. So I think that's the hard part of leadership that we can't teach in business schools, that we can't teach in schools of public policy, is how to do that. I think it's, I, I would argue, it's innate in a lot of people and it's not in others. They just can't really put themselves out there to deal with it. I, I, I agree 100%. And, and, but I think, the, the Mark, wouldn't you agree though, that you know, you're using sort of the power of your position as an enabling force with those people? when you do that, right? You say they don't care as much about you being the, the CEO, okay. but I, I think when you do that, certainly my experience has been, they take a tremendous amount, their cues are so much from that type of leadership. Mm -hmm. what, what they do, how they behave, the enabling power of that, because it's coming from the leadership suite, is enormous. And, and certainly in the organizations that I've led, um, you know, and in the federal government, I really do think it's a lot more about having the right kind of leadership and the, the, the kind of leadership that does exactly what Mark was talking about, which is, you know, becoming an evangelist for where you are heading and why you are heading there and how you need to engage and become a part of it. And by the way, you're all on my team. You know, you know, as a Republican running HUD, that was that was an unusual concept. OK, <laughs> OK, but they were all on my team. You know, and they needed to understand that I believed that, and 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 I really think that's a big issue here. And I think to move, and, and I think it can be done in these agencies. I really do. And it's exactly the kind of leadership and the sensibilities that 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 Mark is referring to. All right. Other question? Yes, Governor. I think this last exchange was interesting on leadership. And Steve, I want to ask you, were you empowered by the president to do this? Or how, how did right. you get the authority? Right. And I'm curious, David, or, you know, what is there about, I mean, the CEO is pretty obvious, uh, the, the, you know, the, but in the government, what, what kind of delegation from whom can give people, how does this happen, can it happen without a president? <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, and, and at what levels and... I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious right. how you get that okay, done. Okay, so, so, so let me just give a quick framework in my view. If you need a new law to make change, it's hit or miss, <laughs> okay? You might be able to get somebody to sponsor it, you might not. If you need a new regulation to make change, it's a very long process where that could take forever, that's very arduous. If you have the budget and if you're not butting heads with the union and it's primarily an operational or quality issue, it is amazing how much latitude you have as a leader. Okay. Now, I will also say, when I, especially when I was at SBA, but also at HUD, I made some very difficult decisions. I made a decision to re-audit all the federal agencies on their small business uh, set-aside numbers and basically went out and basically said, you guys are all, none of your numbers are right. right. It was a very bad reflection uh, on the Bush administration because they'd already said, we hit our numbers, and I went back and said, these guys, it, it ain't right. They're not, the numbers aren't right. I called the White House and said, I want to do this. I think it's the right thing to do about transparency. It's the right thing to do about quality. It sets the right message. And the answer I got back was, if we got to take it in the belly, that's fine if it moves us in the right direction. 
uh, I consistently in, uh, consistently in dealing with OMB and dealing with the leaders in the White House, the message I got back was, we're going to do the right thing. And, 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 and so I, don't th I, I would have had to turn around in many cases if some of those tough issues or uh, politically charged issues um, were things that people said we're not willing to do that because we're concerned about our public image. So I, I was certainly enabled in many ways because of it. But I will tell you, on operational issues, you have a tremendous amount of latitude. In my case, I headed the Government Accountability Office, which was in the legislative branch. And it, it, the Comptroller General is a very unusual job because you're appointed for a 15-year term. You can only be removed by impeachment for specified reasons. Uh, you really don't have a single boss. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a bipartisan, bicameral uh, commission that makes recommendations to the president to select you. The president nominates, the Senate confirms. And, and so basically you have more latitude, but, but frankly you focus on the fundamentals. I'm a principles and values kind of person, okay? I believe in the concept of leading by example. I believe in you need a plan, you need a budget, you need performance metrics, you need to align incentives, transparency and accountability. You need to focus on customers, clients, employees, partners, need, and, and results. You know, it isn't that complicated, right? And so even in the executive branch, most people can do this, all right? Part of the problem you have is twofold. One, there's no comprehensive, integrated, forward-looking, threat risk, opportunity-based, resource-constrained plan for the federal government. There's no outcome-based performance metrics to say, you know, they're outcome-based. How are we doing? Are we getting better and worse? How do we compare to others? Let's look across the silos. Let's look across geopolitical boundaries. We're all in this together. Let's work it on that way. And the other thing is, is that I firmly believe that for large agencies and for challenged agencies, we need chief operating officers. And chief operating officers ought to be at the deputy level with statutory qualification requirements, with a term appointment, with a performance contract, and their job is focused on how do you make the government work better. Econ economy, efficiency, effectiveness, credibility. I mean, I, and I think you could get a lot of people to do that. I mean, the, the, you know, you talked about making, doing public service. I did public service. I didn't do it for the money. I did it to make a difference. And you, you really can make a difference. And I think you would have people that were, would, be, would be willing to do it, you know, if you had the right type of, you know, climate and the right kind of authorities. Is the oversight, just following on with that a little yeah. bit, because I, I think those are excellent responses. The mm -hmm. GAO, you, you did a lot of these studies. We've got a couple of senators yeah. who are going to be here in a few moments. And yeah. At least Senator Colbert is one of those who requested a lot of studies sure. over the years. That's right. Um, do, it, but is the oversight process anachronistic today? It, it certainly is, it seems to have failed, but how, how does oversight get done and, and where, where does it lie? I mean, the agency to respond, the, the committee to hold, it's got to be more than a show hearing. Uh, well, part of the problem is, is that uh, Congress spends way too much time on, uh, for example, the only thing in the Constitution that Congress is supposed to do every year, the only thing, is to pass timely appropriations bills, which ought to be guided by a budget. You know, I mean, that's the policy mechanism, right? Uh, I'm 61 years old. I know that's hard to believe. It's hard for me to believe at times, okay? <laughs> but, but Congress has passed timely budgets and appropriations bills four times in my lifetime, all right? Four times. They, they spend all this time, and for one, we shouldn't even be doing you know, annual appropriations, okay? We should be doing, you know, biennial appropriations. They ought to be spending a lot more time on, on the oversight process. But then you also have situations where GAO does great work, you know, inspectors generals do great work, but typically they won't make a specific policy recommendation. For example, they, they issue these reports and duplicate programs, but they won't say, kill this, consolidate this, they won't do it, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why you need this government transformation initiative. You've got to have, and, and, and what it's all about is, you pick some capable, credible, non-conflicted individuals from the, from the private sector, the public sector, and the not-for-profit sector with proven transformation success. They have the authority to make findings and, re and recommendations, okay, that otherwise won't be made by certain entities and get a guaranteed hearing and get a guaranteed vote. So we have, the process matters. The mechanism matters in order to, to get some results because of the conflicts of interest and the special interest. Hmm. All right, questions, here we go. <clears throat> 
Hi, this question is for Mark. I'm Erin Waters with Governing Magazine. I'm the publisher, so it's off the record. Um, <laughs> as a leader of an industry that's changing, um, as a result and impacted greatly by government, I'd like to know how you're working with government and how's it going? Well, you know, I think um, for us, um, we view the Affordable Care Act as an action-forcing event. Um, it's driving a lot of change in our industry that otherwise wouldn't have happened if it had not been passed. By virtue of the way it was passed um, and the fact that the regulation, the, the legislation was written poorly by virtue of the whole Scott Brown affair in the, in the last few months of the bill, um, there have now been 70,000 plus pages of regulation written that we're trying to figure out. And that has been really, we've been fixing the legislation in regulation as we go back and forth. So we have, you know, we've made an investment in it because my view has been this is a $2.7 trillion industry that's going to get another trillion and a half thrown on top of it, and there has to be a pony in some of that stuff. <laughs> and so our obligation is to make sure we're compliant with the law and give feedback to the government about how we can best make it work. And we've had great relationships with the White House, with HHS, in getting that done. We're now getting ready for the exchanges, as you know, at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But also, there are opportunities to improve our business model and to improve the, the way our business works as a result. And, and so we feel good about where we are. Um, the organization, this has been you know, the, 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 the storm on the horizon I've been able to use to get the organization to change. And I've hung a lot of things on that Christmas tree um, that otherwise wouldn't be there um, had it not shown up. So it's been an action-forcing event. And it's changed our, the nature of our relationship with providers and our customers and a whole host of things. So um, the bill was not complete from the standpoint of getting at that $800 billion worth of costs that are wasted every year, but it's forced the conversation, which we hope over time will only get better. All right, good. Looks like there's another question. <clears throat> this question is for you, Mark, um, but we'd like to also, time permitting, uh, hear others' view of, of if you were in charge of everything, good. you know, whether it's the president or what. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are, you, you talk about operating model, not waiting for legislation. Right. You know, what are some of the things that you would do or, and how would you go about trying to drive change and lasting yeah, change? I think, I think the American public is incredibly resilient and willing to hear the hard news. They've heard it over and over again through the centuries. So um, I think if we lay it all out and say, here's where we are and here's how the, all the difficult things we need to do, no matter how hard they are, I think you get everybody on board. And I had actually had this conversation with the president where I said to him, words matter. And if you were to say to me, and I was sitting next to Alan Mulally, um, the CEO of Ford Motor Company. In 1979, I was putting together rear axles for Ford Motor Company on the Mercury Bobcat. <laughs> on the assembly line. That was my job, full time. And I went back to school so I could be a union steward. Came from a Democratic union family. Uh, Dem and, and so what I said to him is, if you were to say to me, Mark, I want you to pay more now to invest to ensure that the American public, people like you, have an opportunity at the American dream, I'm going to pull my check out, checkbook out and say, how much money do you need to make that happen? If you tell me because I'm rich, i got to pay more taxes, you and I have a fight because I've earned every penny. And it gets back to the point that Steve made earlier. Words can either unite or divide. And I would be very focused on uniting now versus dividing. It's not about spending cuts. It's about ensuring that the entitlement safety nets we have are there three generations from now for people who don't achieve the, the American dream. And what can we do to restore those over a decade or so to make sure they're appropriate and safe? And so you know, one thing I've learned as a CEO, and it's only been 24 months, it's hard to believe that. It's been so short and so long in a lot of ways, is that when you've won, you raise the dialogue and the, above the rhetoric of the fight and you reunite people and you move ahead. And I think if I had one thing to do, that would be it. And I think the rest would follow in, um, in a rush to restore the American dream. And I think that's, that's what's not happening right now. Uh, can I jump yeah, on Of that? course. Truth, transparency, and leadership equals transformation. And I'll be more specific. This country is at a critical crossroads. We're approaching a tipping point. We have a number of areas that we're on an imprudent and unsustainable path. Uh, and by doing nothing, it's a decision. Things get worse. Risk get greater. 
uh, the degree of change is going to be more dramatic, the transition time will be less. That's just the way that it works, okay? I think what President Obama needs to do to make it very concrete, I hope and pray that in his State of the Union address next week, that it's a governing speech, and it's a visioning speech and a uniting speech, uh, because I can tell you that the American people are ahead of the politicians. They know we're in trouble. They're star for truth, leadership, and solutions. And, and, and he needs to be at a high level, you know, on a positive note, pro-growth, you know, social equity, fiscal responsibility. This is about saving the social safety net. It's about generating more growth, generating more jobs. Uh, you know, it, it, it's about investing more and consuming less. You know, there, there are some powerful messages there, and words matter. But you know, only the president is elected by all the people. Only the president has the bully pulpit. Only the president is the chief executive officer. To build on, on David's point, I mean, I think the growth story has got to come out because we're yeah. so focused on the spending and the cuts and all of that, which are necessary. But he's got to lead with how are we going to restore the growth and what are we going to do in terms of energy? What are we going to do in terms of the economic growth so we get back to 3 4% as opposed to dwindling in the 1.5%? And I think he's got an opportunity to use that as a bit of a rallying cry and try to get everybody to understand that we can go back to what we used to be in the context of leading the world. And I think the growth agenda has got to be paramount. I, I worry that we'll get too focused on the, yeah. on the cuts and the, the sort of the other side of it, that there's not enough focus on that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I really do think that the primary focus needs to be truly what's going to drive growth in the economy and growth and opportunity, okay? I, I think where uh, this issue with the American public being smart, which I very much agree with, comes into play, is I don't think people believe what they hear. I think when people hear about the health care legislation, they don't believe it's going to deliver what they say it is, and they don't believe it's going to be more cost efficient. When people hear about what Dodd-Frank is going to do, I don't think they believe the rhetoric. I think, I, I think you, know, if, you know, if I could you know, uh, be the benevolent dictator for a day, you know, getting people together and honestly put something together that's sensible, that truly does what people say it does, um, uh, would be an enormous step forward. I know that may be Pollyanna-ish, but we end up with these just massively complex, larded up pieces of major legislation that are crushing us. And I think it's, it's just an enormous uh, uh, issue of leadership. And that's, that, that's, that's, that's where I think, I think if we could, if we as, as, a, as a governmental leadership could come together and actually compromise in ways that are sensible and truly do what we say they're going to do, I think we'd be way ahead of the game. Can I mention one other thing? Sure. When, when I went on this 10,000 mile tour, we exposed people to six principles for a grand bargain. Pro-growth was the first one, okay, but it wasn't the only. 92% support. We talked to people about specific reforms for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, health care, defense, taxes, budget controls, management reforms, political reforms. Minimum 77% support, up to 90. What's the problem? No leadership. All right, we have a question over here. I just want to say first, uh, thank you, Governor Engler, for organizing this and for all of you for participating. This is an unusual forum to see, you know, senior business leaders talking about uh, management and transformation of government. So my question to you is, how do you grow uh, this group? Um, how do you get your peers in the business community to see there's a real value <clears throat> to creating a constituency for effective government and not simply engaging on the policy level? And then to the point you've all made about leadership, how do you as individual leaders take ownership of, of that problem and, and address it? Great questions. All right. So, I mean, I'm happy to start, right? Because um, I go back to when the governor and I first talked about this about a year ago, right? And, and where he got me at hello was when he <laughs> said, imagine if, regardless of who wins the, the election, imagine if we could go with a bit of a playbook and say, here's specific ideas, mm -hmm. concrete things that we can do to really solve a number of the questions, uh, problems that we have today in, in our nation that frankly are really nonpartisan. I mean, we can both agree that, that this is the kind of stuff that we could do. So I still go back to that, Governor, what you and I discussed, and I think there is an opportunity to take the output of this conversation with others that we're having and be able to share some specific, concrete things that we can do 
that the business community supports, that a number of other folks in, in, in government support, and that there's a bit of a coalition around this that I think could be the beginnings of something that shouldn't be a Democrat versus Republican, but rather is something that as Americans we need to do. That's my hope. Yeah, yeah I think um, one of my three objectives to leave as a legacy when I am retired from my job um, and by the way, CEOs generally last about four and a half, five years, so it's not much different than politicians. We just don't know when the end's coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are any dates. Somebody sneaks up behind you. Um, but, it's usually somebody from the board. But uh, one, of my, one of my objectives is to reestablish the credibility of corporate leadership in the eyes of the American public. And, and, and in order to do that, you have to be out there. And so I said to my PR team, you can't protect me, you can only prepare me. And so I'm available, I'm transparent, I'm honest about what's going on. I disagree when I disagree and allow people to speak their mind. There are a group of CEOs, started with five of us two, over two years ago, there's now 80 of us, called Higher Ambition Leaders, who are looking for a way that corporate America can do good and do well that our obligation to our communities is far more important than just pure obligation of the shareholders. And Aetna has been steeped in this tradition. In the 30s, we built our building, and including making the bricks, with our employees to keep them employed during the Depression. We made payroll for the city of Hartford for six months in the 70s when they went bankrupt because it was important to keep the city functioning. We've given away $425 million as a foundation over the last 30 years since we put that, since we started paying the payroll in Hartford, because we believe it's important for us to support the communities we live in. And our employees give a million hours every three years to the communities they live in. And we bank that. And then we match all of our employees giving up to $10,000 per employee every year as part of their United Way and giving programs. Yeah. It's important for us to be part of the community. And I think it's a good idea for corporations to do that as well. And so we're trying to gather these leaders together. And I think a great idea would be part of that being a higher ambition leader is to help government be better. Right. Instead of using our lobbyists, going in, getting my 15 minutes with this senator or that congressman, you know, throwing my, you know, my PAC money at whoever needs to be thrown money at, and then going home and hoping it works. Um, I think it would be much better working at the levels we're talking about here to get things done versus... Um, versus playing that game. Good, here, here. All right, so wrapping this up, final point. So if the definition of it to transform means to undergo a change in form, appearance, or character from the Latin word mm -hmm. to change in shape, what one piece of practical advice do all of you have to transform the federal government? I'm going to start with you. I, I think... Um, I go back to a partnership. I don't think government can do it alone. I think we as businesses need to help. Okay. And I think we've got to figure out specific ways that we come together and do that. And I do think that the examples where I've seen that that has worked the best mm -hmm. is where there has been this partnership and togetherness. And so I, that would be my, my Great. answer. Great. Mark. The courage to be honest about what's wrong and to step forward and say, here's what we need, you know, here's, here's, here's what's going on, here's what we need to do. And I think that takes a lot of courage in our environment, the way we reward people in the political system um, is not to be forthright and courageous in saying what's wrong. Great. Steve. I think some, kind of a, some type of an aggressive program to get uh, uh, strong leadership in these organizations uh, at or very close to the top that have a vision for how to transform what it takes and, and sort of uh, the, um, you know, sort of the courage to, to make it happen. Great. A mechanism that will enable a lot of great ideas that have existed for a long time uh, become reality, uh, given the many special interests and the many conflicts of interest that exist uh, at the present time. All right. Well, let's thank uh, this great panel for taking time to come join us here today. And, Governor, it's back over to you. All right. Expecting uh, Senator Pryor and Senator Colbert in a moment, so I'm hoping a few of you will stay, since we got the two two of the key players in the Senate that might help on 
developing such a mechanism as David Walker talked about or playing a lead, leading role in trying to uh, deal with how we begin this conversation between the executive and the legislative branch. And that's why we titled this last session the Legislative Oversight of Executive Organization and Management. And the two senators are, are pretty key. Uh, they're both uh, senior members on the Committee Homeland Security and uh, Government Affairs Committee. So uh, I know we're going to be pretty quick in wrapping things up uh, because Senator Pryor's got a plane, so he's going to be leaving shortly after 5. So if they're here, we'll put them right on and we'll get everybody out of here uh, quite quickly. And uh, I thought I might, uh, you know, just, you know, you, you know these gentlemen, but uh, rather than waiting for them, I could... Uh, um, I, one, of the, one of the challenges we've had today is Matt Sonneson, who's done such a good job in putting the program together, is a former Senate employee. And under the miserable rules that they adopted governing former Senate employees, he's not allowed to be in the room. So he's listening at keyholes around here. But, he, <laughs> but he, technically, he's not supposed to be in the room until I think it's June sometime is when we, when we get uh, Senator Pryor here. I do Kath want to thank, I think Kathleen has stepped out with the speakers, but uh, I certainly appreciate her, her work today. And uh, we, we think with these guys. So.